Okay. So my name is Chris Thompson. I am, as I always say, for now, the executive director at Generator. I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of Jumpstart. Um, so just once again, um, Jumpstart is an entrepreneurship series. This, uh, this session of Jumpstart is specifically for artists. And the notion behind this uh, panel speaker series is um, when you're starting out as an artist, nobody really tells you how it works. Uh, in fact, they pretend that it's this like you know really magical thing that everybody gets, hangs out in their studio, and then suddenly, you know, a curator walks through the door and says, "Oh my God, you're going to be famous!" Right? No, that's not how it works. So the idea behind this is that we are um, we're pretending. So all artists do this. You have you get together with some friends at a bar, and that's why we have beer, uh, and uh, and you you like have sort of a you know. Like like a, not a gripe session. You just like talk about what's happening and how it and, and it comes out over time how it really works. And especially if you start as a new artist, you sort of follow in with a group like that. That's typically how you learn about how the art world really works. And that's how you learn about. You think uh, uh, I've said before that um, when I start looking at, um, about what MFA programs do, I assumed that they told you how the art world worked and how to become successful in it, and they do not. They pretend that it all happens magically. So anyway, so this is that. The idea is uh, we're going to have um, uh, three artists uh, and a moderator uh, who are going to pretend that they're in a bar simply with 45 of their best friends hanging out. And so there's going to be some honesty. We're going to encourage people to say what really happens, what they really think. They won't use any names because, remember, Vermont is a very small state. Right, but they can hint at names. No, they can't do that. Anyway, so the idea is just simply, you know, to be honest about it. And um, the art world, in some ways, is inherently unfair because people don't give you the starting rules. And so this is we're, we're attempting to le uh, level the playing field. Essentially, at the end of this, you should have the basic rule set, and then really, it's just up to you. So. Um, if I can, I'm going to invite everybody up. Christine Hill, who's our Director of Communications, is going to be the moderator tonight, and I'm going to let her take it from here, except for I'm going to thank our sponsors. The Kaufman Foundation, CEDO, Davidson Hodgkin's uh, um, Accountants, uh, the Vermont Arts Council, uh, and some individual sponsors, Val Hurd, Pat Robbins, and Lisa Schomburg, Michael Metz, and Denise, uh, David Raphael, and Nicole Karjian. Anyway, thank you so much for making this possible. I'm turning it over to Christine. Here she is. Hi. Um, cool, yeah. Artists, you want to come on up and join me? I don't have anything special to say. Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna let you introduce yourselves once you're all settled. Um, but yeah, welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Um, I think the best part of this series so far has been that it's it feels really cozy and intimate um, and more like a conversation. So I have a couple questions, but really um, I'm gonna let these guys do most of the talking and then I want you all to do the talking. So if you are thinking of questions as we're chatting up here, hold on to them and uh, at the end we'll just kind of have a big old conversation. So um, let's start if each of you could just introduce yourselves and talk a little bit, like five minutes maybe about who you are, where you came from, and how you came to do the work that you currently do. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Corinne. I wish I didn't sit. I thought someone would sit next to me so I wouldn't have to be the first one. <laughs> uh, I am a painter. Uh, that's my primary role, but I do, uh, you know, I think this whole panel is kind of like a unique set of artists. So in addition to being a painter, I also do uh, community projects and audio projects and do some art coaching as well. Um, now I have, uh, 
My funding model is pretty unique in that I partner a lot with nonprofits, mostly with housing nonprofits, to do the community related projects, which I'm happy to talk more about later. Um, is that good for now? Yeah. Great. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Adriana Sape. Uh, I run a small illustration company called Ink with Intent. Um, we do mostly wedding related things, ketubahs and wedding certificates. For those of you who are not familiar with Jewish wedding customs, a ketubah is a piece of art in a ceremonial document that's signed before the wedding. So I got into it in 2013, I was trying to find a way to make a living as an artist because it's what I wanted to do and I had already been fired from like two different jobs. And uh, I was being very unsuccessful at it. I was trying to paint pet portraits, it was not going well. Um, but I was DIYing my own wedding and I ended up doing a ketubah for that. And uh, after the dust had settled from the wedding, I thought that was really fun, I, I, I should do a few more. So I made like five more designs and then I thought I should start an Etsy shop. So I started an Etsy shop um, and about a week later I made my first sale. Uh, and then six years later, it's grown into my full-time job. Uh, I have a team of, we're a team of four. Um, so at this point I pretty much just do the illustration work and some custom work uh, and my team handles all the customer service and the graphic design and the translation, which is great. Um, so yeah, it was sort of a really lucky break. And I do want to mention briefly that um, I was very lucky to enter the right market at the right time. There weren't a lot of other young artists in Judaica six years ago. <laughs> it's changing. There's actually a big influx of young artists now. So, But at the time, it was kind of easy to stand out because of that. Um, also, I was able to take it full time more quickly because I was staying very, very lean. I didn't have a studio space. Uh, I was working at my kitchen table on my laptop in Wisconsin and all the money I was earning from Etsy, I was able to not, I didn't have to put it back into the company. I could actually like buy groceries with it. So <laughs> um, kind of keeping my expenses very, very low at the beginning helped me to build uh, that more quickly. Um, sorry. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. The third thing I want to mention was that uh, it is currently my full time job, and I'm happy to dig into the finances if anyone is interested, sort of what that trajectory looked like. Uh, but yeah, I, I remember when I was first starting out, I would see other artists and really wonder if they were. Um, really doing it for work or <laughs> if they had some secret source of income and they were just sort of doing it for fun. But I now know that it is possible. You can do it for work. It can be your job and other people's job too. So I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <There> you <laughs> My name is Abby Manock and I currently live in Brooklyn, um, but I grew up here and I consider myself still connected here in the art scene. I don't know what you call it. Um, I do a lot of different things, some of which I consider like my art and some of which are just like art related things that I do that might look like what, what people think is my art, but maybe that's something I shouldn't say. <laughs> Um, Definitely say but, that. Uh, I think that I'm interested in that gray area between commission and commercial stuff and, you know, the stuff that I know what's clearly, like, the crazy thing that I can pull out of my head, and that's, like, not always the thing that I can afford to do the way that I think of it. So I try to, like, do a little stuff here and there, and a lot of it's sort of crafty, but I think just, like keeping it going and uh, with every job that I take that isn't something that's necessarily my idea, I still feel like I can enjoy it or like put something of my own work into it that, I don't know, I learn stuff from like the jobs I have. So uh, I'm really bad at like saying what kind of artist I am, but I do like a lot of things. <laughs> can you, for those unfamiliar with, <clears throat> with some of the things you've done, can you like imagine the spectrum of your work and then give something from like this side, this side, and in the middle? Yeah, um, I've 
I've done a lot of music festival, sort of interactive, performative, visual, durational stuff <laughs> that involves inventing characters that have certain personality traits and they sort of interact with audience and then things happen and evolve over time and it all kind of has this cosmology and symbolism that goes with it, which sounds like super vague. <laughs> um, but if you look at the website, if you saw it, you would understand. Um, and then I also, you know, for, to earn money, I work as a, fo like an assistant on photo shoots. Um, I just worked um, with a team of miniature makers for a TV show that's coming out next year. Um, I paint murals, I do like some custom props for sort of like indie to mid-range films, I guess. And I'm just sort of like the, per hopefully the person that people like, if you, if someone needs like a costume or a thing or a s object that doesn't exist in the real world, they're like, oh, well we could call her, <laughs> maybe she can make it. And I usually can, so. Like that's, I want to be like more on the front of more people's minds. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great. Okay. That's a great answer. Um, cool. So each of you sort of touched on this a little bit, but given that the, the title of tonight's talk is the DIY model, um, I'm hoping that you can sort of expand on what you've already said about uh, the channel or channels that you find yourself in and um, talk about the strategies that you use to get more work in those channels. So be it mural painting or working with nonprofits or selling on Etsy. Um, how you ended up there, what strategies you use while you're there and then share any insights you have based on your successes and failures. And we'll just, yeah, go this way again. So I'll start again. <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny that this uh, lecture series exists now because uh, I feel like a year ago, this is the kind of thing I was really looking for. I did the Mercy Connections small business program and I, I know kind of um, what some of the students here are, are learning about in terms of uh, constructing their business and so I'll say right away the thing that I have paid for is not a product it's a service so for me um, when I do have my art funded it's usually with grants that I will seek out and apply for with nonprofits and when I when I'm doing that it's it's usually a, a community driven project uh, and I got into that kind of work in uh, I feel like a pretty unique way. Um, I did. I was doing. I did two years of AmeriCorps service for a housing nonprofit called the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. And being a coalition, its members are all um, either housers, like affordable housers. Uh, for instance, Champlain Housing Trust is one that would come to mind in our, in our local community. But it's a statewide nonprofit. Um, so. During my AmeriCorps service, I developed a story-driven um, story project called Voices of Home, and I was working with uh, residents in low-income housing to tell their story, and then kind of outside of my AmeriCorps service, I was using those audio interviews I took with the residents to uh, create visual projects that um, eventually ended up being installed in some of the communities I was working with. Uh, so I've been doing that for now um, four years, or yeah, four years, and um, it's been a really uh, steep learning curve in that um, I'm only now like creating a sustainable practice around that. So uh, the first two years, of course, I was doing AmeriCorps for that. That was partially funding uh, me working with the residents, and um, AmeriCorps doesn't pay very well. Uh, and then I'd be working outside of my 50 hours of AmeriCorps to create these paintings or art installations. Um, so that's kind of like one branch of my practice. And then I, I'm pretty intentional uh, in treating my personal projects as just as important as my community-driven projects. So I have uh, a more private 
practice where I do uh, figurative work. And again, I structure it as like a project. So I have um, a specific kind of like problem I'm working with. I have a set group of people I'm working with. I have a timeline for it. Um, I have applied for grants for that part of my project, but not as much because grant writing is kind of um, a very exhaustive process and um, can kind of constrain what you actually make. So I, I liked having my more private practice be something that was completely uh, driven by myself. And I, I think uh, that's, those are the kind of questions that probably a lot of you are going to start to like have to ask yourself just in terms of like who's this for? What does it mean to have it funded? Um, who am I working with to make this? And who's going to be looking at it? And where it's going to be, like where it's going to live in the world? Uh, does that answer? Should I, should I have? Yes. Great. Uh, so I sort of took an approach of um, being kind of a business first artist. Um, I knew I loved to draw and I wanted to make pretty things. Um, and I needed people to buy them in order to do it as much as I wanted to do it. Uh, so it was kind of just a lucky chance that um, I, you know, put my art on a ketuba and it sold. Um, can I just ask, when you did that, Etsy's changed a lot since, did you say 2013? Yeah. Uh, did you do any kind of like paid promotion or anything like that? Or did you literally just make the listing? Yeah, I, I meant to. Um, <laughs> it it kind of took off kind of fast in some ways. Um, and the nice thing about being in the wedding industry too is that products are just really artificially marked up. Um, so when I was pricing my work to be competitive with what everyone else was charging, I was selling prints for $300. Um, and there's additional value added to it because, you know, I put Hebrew texts on it. I advise clients on, you know, how to make a legal ketubah and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, so once I got a taste for getting money from my art, I kind of just went for it um, and started learning a lot more about business and figuring out what my niche was and uh, doing a little bit of social media marketing. But it was a really great space to be in as an illustrator because everyone who's Jewish who has a wedding has to buy one of these. and Well, almost everyone does. Um, and there weren't that many people making them. And then there was me there, and so a lot of them started buying them from me. Um, and the space has actually gotten much more competitive since then, which is really exciting, because there's so many amazing new artists who are in this space. So if any of you guys are Jewish, yeah, consider this space. It's a great place to be. Um, <laughs> uh, I, what was the second half of your question? Sorry. Um, insights you have based on your successes and failures, which is particularly interesting for you, I think, because um, Abby and Corinne both do a lot of different things, but I think you do like a very concrete product-based thing, so, which I think a lot of people here can relate to. Um, so, Yeah, so I mean, all of the basics of a business apply, even if it's an art product. Um, you know, you need systems in place to keep track of all your clients. So on a busy month for us, we'll have at 200 people we're working with at the same time, and each person has an incredible number of details that need to be kept track of. So we've developed systems for keeping track of all of that and, uh, you know, figured out ways to be really, really sorry when we've occasionally screwed stuff up. And it's a, it's a high stake. So the reason they're so expensive is because if you screw up a ketuba, it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty picture. Um, it's not just like, oops, we'll send you another one. It's like, whoops, we kind of invalidated your wedding, so we'll send you another one. <laughs> um, but it, so there's been a couple of ugly incidents. But yeah, I mean, everything you're learning as far as the basics of business definitely, definitely apply to, to an illustration product like this too. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. I could 
that definitely Metroid. validated the <laughs> entire premise of this program that Generator is <laughs> currently running. So You're the idea that an art business is in fact a business and that you need the structure in it, place if you want, to support it, yeah, it's growth. So for sure, if you want it to be a business, you like obviously tons of art is not a business, and that's great too, and we need that. <laughs> so you don't have to make money from it, but you should if you're in this program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know how to start. <laughs> um, how, what was the first um, project you did where you got paid and you were like, huh, this could be a thing? And then how did you get from there to here? I did a lot of stuff without getting paid without even knowing that I should be getting paid mm. for a really, really long time. So. <laughs> Maybe it seemed like I was getting paid, but I wasn't. <laughs> um, but I did a lot of stuff just with my friends. Like, that's what we just did. We, like, made, made up stuff and did some shows and sat around and talked about making more shows or doing stuff. So um, I was working in restaurants and doing whatever and doing my, it's just what I did. I didn't ever really think of it as like, oh, this is my job. This is just what I am and who I, this is what I do. Um, and then it really changed for me when I went to visit a friend and her mom was a, uh, the professor, sculpture professor at the museum school in Boston. And she was like, well, what, like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, putting on these things and like getting everyone to come out and like do the thing. And she was just like, why don't you come to this post back program and like, do, why don't you go to art school? And I was like, oh, okay. Like maybe that's a place that I could channel that. Some, I don't know. I needed someone to be like, this is where you go. <laughs> like point you and like shove you. Um, and so I went there for a year for a post back and it didn't really teach me anything other than like, I just do all the, like I met some people and, but I, I still didn't understand like the art world. I just didn't understand why I was the only one at the school. Like, where is everybody? I would be there like 24 hours a day, like working on the same stuff and people would go home and there was only a few people that were like around doing intensely like their projects. So, um, but that's when I started developing some of these things. And the critique around what I was doing was what really started to help me figure out, like, what, am, what do I care about? What is, what is art? What is, just to put it somewhere. So then I started, um, I got involved with like doing fish concert, taking some of those ideas that I just sort of developed in a critique situation, studio situation, and actually like pitching them to do at a, in a space. And so that was just because I knew, people knew that I did these things. And I can't really, ex that's not a good answer of like how that happens, but <laughs> it's just like, no, it's oh, great. You know, let's call, maybe she could do something for the fish concert, you know, but it wasn't like anything to do with the fish concert. It was just like, someone's gonna let me bring my like characters that I developed and people were gonna look at them. At, and they just were fish fans that looked at them. <laughs> But everyone assumed that the band made it up, so like I don't think I had any got any credit for it, at least the first year. But I didn't care. Like I still got to do it. It was fun. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I feel like I'm just. I could go. Like, this is taking too long. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> so, um, I mean, because you basically so what I, I'm hearing when is I went to. I got my MFA from Columbia. I just applied with this music festival work, which I was lucky to like. You know, the once I did it the first year, they're like, "Oh, that was cool." So, like, when I pitched the bigger thing, like the next year, they're like, "Okay, that's like a bigger budget." But she did it, so okay. And then, like, then I had the pictures and all the. I did these projects, which no one knew who funded it. I didn't say I didn't write fish concert on my, on my application. I just called my. It was just my my project. So. Do you think that would have hurt you? I don't think it would have mattered. <laughs> Like, I, it wasn't anything to do with it, so it didn't even occur to yeah. me, to, but that wasn't part of it. But um, I guess, long story short, I went to grad school not really knowing what the art world was, which seems like so, 
how could that even happen? You know, but I still was really naive going in. And I just thought like, well, obviously the next place is a gallery for my work. But it took like two years of grad school and a lot of critiques and a lot of people not really knowing what I was doing. And I didn't even like still know what I was doing. But after that, I started showing my work in a gallery in Miami. And I still, like, it was just, I hadn't had time to process it. I was just sort of, like, really confused as to, like, the whole art market and fairs and Art Basel and all this stuff. And I was, but I was given this opportunity to, like, show this work, but it wasn't done. And so I was, like, taking the opportunities that were, like, given to me. But, like, it all started to go too fast. And I wasn't, I was showing work that I knew wasn't ready and wasn't good. But I was, like, doing it anyway. And I just... At one point, I was getting on a plane to go to Art Basel to do my solo show, and I was like, I don't even care if this plane crashes, because I'm, it's, I don't even care. And I'm like, if this is like good, this is not good. Like this is, something's wrong here. Like this, I should be happy about this, and I am so like sad. Like this is just like a speeding train towards a wall. Like it's not right. It doesn't, I'm like, I felt like a faker. I just felt like I didn't know what I was doing. And so uh, I just like left. I went, I came back, well, I first went to Maine and then I came back here. Um, and I still was with the gallery, but it was kind of like, I, sh I didn't really trust what was going on there. And she didn't want to show my work the way I wanted to. And I didn't really know how to tell her that or stand up for myself because I felt like I owed her something because she was like, I don't know, it's just this big knot of like confusion and also like, selling the work was not, I don't know. And I had a lot of friends from grad school who had different situations and everything's going smoothly, but they liked to schmooze and I really didn't. And so I came back here and just kind of like started not, left the gallery and uh, I don't know, just started like getting involved in the community again because that's I think where I started and that's what I knew and so I started to like talk to people and be like, oh, I can paint that thing. Or then it was like, oh, you make this weird plaid blog. Why don't you paint this barn for Cabot? Like, that's how, like, I can't even tell you a story that was like more, it was just by chance. Like, I was just like going into there and they're like, oh, we need a plaid painter. And I was like, I paint pat, well, I paint <laughs> plaid. And they're like, oh, let's do it. So like, okay. Um, you know, and now like, five barns later and like <laughs> did that come out of any of the free work that you had done in the past like how did they how did you get oh, connected with I them? had a blog on blogspot it's still there if you want to check uh <laughs> plaid voyeurism project.blogspot.com <laughs> because when I first moved to New York um I I had a flip phone with a with a camera which was like really new for me and I realized that every, like a lot of people in New York started wearing like red buffalo plaid, and I realized it was like it was fashion, and it was also like work old workmen. So I would try. I had all these different techniques, like the fake phone call, and I'd try to like. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd have all these like surrogates that were doing it for me and sending. Oh, but before that, I was doing the um, glove it or leave it, which was one of my first projects here, which was like I was just collecting dirty gloves from the street that were lost. Oh, there's an author who takes pictures. Yeah, they got all the credit. But it was me who was doing it first, but I did <laughs> not have a website. <laughs> and I was hand drawing it all, like the um, like Jay Peterman catalog. <laughs> Do you know the Jay Peterman catalog? Does anyone know the Jay Peterman catalog? <laughs> or like the Camp Moore, like it's all drawn. So I didn't even have a, I, this was like pre, the, the plaid thing was a step up because it was actually a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and my whole apartment was covered with the like, dirty gloves that I had these like handwritten tags on and then I was trying to like make a database and then send someone a glove that they could wear. I mean, it was like and then I realized like a lot of people lose the right gloves because they take their glove off to like do stuff with and then I have like this <laughs> all of this stuff, you know, all the information um <laughs> which nobody cared about. <laughs> <laughs> and then Cabot gave you a bunch of money to paint a barn plaid? Um, well, then the, the blog spot was just, it was like, it was, I always sort of had these projects that someone, 
although like it's hard for me to describe what my practice is, there's always like that thing that's like, oh, you're the girl that does the glove thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've totally forgot about that. <laughs> right, no, please. And now then it was the International Survey of Hand Dryers, in, which is like another thing where like I didn't have to collect it. I could just take a picture of it. But like I stopped doing it because somebody else on Instagram was like doing it way better. Like mine was a joke and theirs was like, actually like they were doing it every day and I was, I was like oh, fine mine was like funny and yours is like really thorough <laughs> mine was like inventing the backstory of the you know you had to review it and like but this I don't know so but people still send me the hand dryers I'm like oh, send it to the other person because <laughs> they're really serious about it um but yeah I think it's like making up like the backstory to all this like fake information is <laughs> sort of like always interested me. Just like I find it funny, like I don't even mean to do it. I just start amassing like stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I try not to have the physical stuff because that just. Um, anyway, so now I went when I moved back to New York. I went back because I was teaching. I got an adjunct. I was doing some adjunct teaching for drawing. And that which sort of like got me back to New York because it's hard to move back to New York once you leave because of housing and whatever. It all kind of worked out. And um, then I started working because a friend of mine, and the only reason I like got this job with like doing the Toys R Us Christmas catalog set making was because my friend, like growing up, we used to like make stuff together, like make Halloween costumes or do whatever. We were just like crafty kids. So she was like, oh, wait, I know the person to come in here to like build like Barbie Subway and like all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, sure, like, okay. So I think I just kind of like, I think you just have to keep in touch with your friends. I don't know, that's like my best <laughs> advice. <laughs> that's totally fair, yeah. Yeah. It's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. It's just like being a nice person and doing what you say. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm a communications person. I'm supposed to be writing down quotes, but I can't because I'm up here right now. And that was a really good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll watch it later. Um, cool. So uh, in each of those responses, I heard at least a little bit about sacrifice that you've made throughout your creative journey and business journey. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how you um, retain your artistic vision and motivation um, while also like mass producing product, for example, or taking on work that you might not be interested in, um, be it a day job or commercial work or what have you. So how do you balance those two things and know when to say yes and when to say no? Can I go? Yes. Okay. Um, someone gave me, I, you know, I was asking, like trying to get that answer from many people like how what do i do uh, you know and you're flailing and trying to find somebody to give you advice but someone told me once like think of it like a tripod like the tripod leg like you are on the top and the tr and the tripod has three legs and the legs are is it fun does it pay you a lot or do you get like good visibility exposure from it and if it doesn't stand up then you should not take that job <laughs> you know and i was like okay like, it can be, like, short on money, but super fun, and everybody sees it. Or it can be, like, tons of money, totally not fun, but everybody sees it okay. And it's, like, you have to kind of, like, weigh it out. And, like, I just did, I, I'm on this um, listserv in New York called Art Cube. I don't know if like, there's anything here like that, but it's really, like, works for that. I think it's in a lot of cities. But um, it has a listing of, like, sort of arts-ish, artsy jobs, or, you know, a lot of, like, photo assistant, like stuff like that. But you kind of do it when you need something. It's not well, that reliable, but it's like, I've gotten a few good things from it. So it like a couple weeks ago, I was just like, I need something. And so I signed up or said, like got the job to do this install, overnight install in this restaurant. And I didn't really read that it was overnight. Like, so that was bad. <laughs> like you should read the thing like carefully. Um, and I was like, oh, you never know. Like sometimes you go and you meet people in these things and it leads to something else or just, I don't know. I'm like, ah, how bad could it be? <laughs> and this was just a nightmare. Like it was like, <laughs> it was, I don't even know if I should say the restaurant. Um, do it. Okay, well, have you, do you guys heard of Italy in New York? Okay, well, it's this like 
big um, sort of like Italian markets and products and restaurants and it's in Madison Square Park and I think there's another one in like Tribeca somewhere. Anyway, a lot of people really like it and I think the markets and stuff are really good but there's this one restaurant that's like on the rooftop and it's seasonal but they have these fake horrible like floral decorations. It's very themed. It's kind of like Italy Epcot kind of. It's just like horrible. And I don't know if anyone who's ever worked in a restaurant that smell like when the restaurants are open of kind of like bacteria <laughs> kind of smelled like that and I'm kind of like ugh and then the stuff that they had was just all this glitter and stuff was just falling in the food and so we took all this stuff down and it was just like we were ugh, like coughing and co- this dusty like flower stuff and then they were putting in like the winter and the girl that was running it like had no idea what was going on. And like we were like flocking the stuff in the restaurant with spray paint and flock. She didn't know she didn't put anything down. Like, it was getting cemented to the floor. It wasn't working. And I'm just kind of like, girl, like you don't even know like <laughs> how to do this. And there's 18 people here working. There were supposed to be four nights of it. And like it was you could just see this like fake flock stuff like falling as they carried it to like put this like over canopy and I was just like I'm gonna finish this shift I'm gonna do like I'm just gonna I'm just gonna work steadily till it's over I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna quit <laughs> like because this is terrible and I did and I just wrote her a nice email saying hey like it wasn't what I expected but I still got paid you know I got paid for my day and like it's a terrible job like I'm sure half the people quit it's so bad and so when you found yourself in situations like that where you've taken on work like that or other work, and you, I mean, do you find yourself sort of like questioning your life choices and questioning? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, but, and, but how do you, how do you like keep your eye on the prize of like, no, like this I'm is what like, I do. I said I was, I'm not going to like, if I left someone else on that crew would have had to like pick up my slack, you know, and that's not fair. So I'm like, I'll do this. It's only like three more hours at that point, you know, like keep my mouth shut and do it like I don't owe her anything but like I don't have to come back like give her enough notice like whatever like she'll put it back on the art cube I'm sh- I saw and then I saw <laughs> then it's funny to watch it come back on the thing and then she's like does anyone know how to make a flocking machine we're desperate <laughs> like the, the next couple of days I'm just like oh I'm never going there again. oh it's horrible but um yeah she shouldn't have that job. She doesn't know how to do it. And, like the, and the health department is going to, like, find them. <laughs> so, but eh, I got, like, $187 out of it. Excellent. <laughs> um, either of you? Um, my, um, so... I, I, I think the question remind me uh, talking Sorry. about like when you're when you're you know mass producing ketubas right. and you're deep in administrative duties and you're hiring and firing people and when you're like really in the thick of um, doing the parts of your job that you don't want to do because it sounds like I mean you're doing this full time so um, how do you it actually sounds like you're kind of in a sweet spot where you're able to do that yeah how, how do you do that it's, it's so good, man. Like, you hire people, and you give them the work you don't want to do. Um, what was the territory like? Okay, did you find yourself in that spot where you had the work to outsource to employees, but you couldn't quite afford it? So what happened was I had, was pregnant with my first daughter um, in 2016, and I wanted to take maternity leave, but I didn't want to lose momentum on my business. And so I crunched the numbers and I figured that if I hired someone, then I wouldn't make any money, but my business would keep trucking along and then I could pick back up. So I hired someone on a temporary basis and I don't know how it happened, but I was still making money um, while not working. And I was like, whoa, this is such a novel concept. And so I hired a second person um, and it worked again. And the, the reason it worked is that um, the it was taking them, these are high price products, and it was taking them much less time than I thought it would to kind of handle the tasks that I was doing. Um, and then it freed me up to just like create more art 
Um, and so I was adding a bunch of new products and um, I was able to take on a bunch of commissions that I didn't have time for before. And I was only working about 10 hours a week uh, that year because I had a baby. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's a big part of it. And the other, so I will say that I have said yes to projects that were a giant mistake, um, commissions specifically, because the commission pieces are run about $1,000. And I remember I took on one client who had a very like, well-developed vision of this ketubah that had an owl and a monkey cooking together in a kitchen. And the monkey is like grinding pepper into a soup, but he's in love. And so he's missing the pot of soup with the pepper. It was so specific. And so I spent like a week on this piece. Oh, I'm like, that sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> Over. <laughs> I still have it because they saw it and they were like, what is this shit? <laughs> like they hated it and they wouldn't pay for it. And so that was, you know, a big wasted week. Um, and I get really angry when time gets wasted because I have two kids at home and I have so little time to work that, you know, I don't have 40 hours a week. I have about 20. Um, and so that's the amount of time I have to run this company in. But uh, I will say that the other key to kind of freeing yourself up to do the work you want to do is um, to kind of develop some passive income along with active income. Uh, so I have a bunch of pre-made designs that I've created over the last six years um, that are on my website. And when they get sold, I, I literally never work with that client. Like my amazing customer service person kind of onboards them. My graphic designer will lay out all the text. The translator you know, will fill out all the details for them. Um, and I do nothing. Uh, and then so my time is freed up to draw new designs. And right now I'm working on a second picture book. And the first one is not published. <laughs> uh, but hoping it will be one day. Um, and so it just kind of lets me stay interested in what I'm doing, even though it's also very businessy. I just want to add on to your first point, the hiring somebody. Um, I make jewelry, and then I work here part time. And on Monday, I paid a friend who needed work for five hours of work. And it felt very indulgent, because I can't really, like, I can't afford to do that. But I was like, eh, I can like throw her 100 bucks and like have her do random things around my studio just like prep work and stuff. And it completely changed the way I thought about my own time. It completely changed the way I thought about my business. Um, and I felt like I was flirting with that, that experience you had when you were having a baby and you hired someone and you were like, huh, and now I can just like do the parts that I like. Like I experienced that for like two hours. And, um, and it was really constructive and like she was happy and I was happy and it just like totally, it was kind of a transformative moment, so. Um, I can say too that there are smaller ways to do it. You don't have to like hire an employee. You could identify a couple of tasks that you're slow and bad at and hire those out and free yourself up. And it's scary, but like I really don't make that much money, but I like it it was really helpful and I was able to kind of like think strategically about what I was having her do and um yeah. So, just to echo that well, in a different way. Oh, thank you. I have an employee now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Corinne? Um, yeah, so I, I guess the thing that uh, came to mind right away for me is just once you start being self-employed, it feels like all like time is money all the time. Um, so it's really easy to fall into this like cycle of never not working, um, which is the thing that really got me uh, the past, I'm like, oh, like last year that was really bad, but... <laughs> you know, the past four years. Um, so I, like, for me, it's, it's looked like a lot of um, trying, like Google Calendar is my best friend. I do a lot of like block scheduling. Um, I have reminders to put away my phone at certain times of night. I uh, have given myself curfews to like be home. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm like f my own worst enemy in terms of like, like the time is money thing. And then also when you when you start out as being like your own like business, um, you know you're hiring yourself to do this work. You, it really comes down to like what like you have to know your own personal finances, which 
like sounds really obvious, but and I, I felt like I knew my own finances really well until I took my the Mercy Connections small business program and then really started like looking into it and realizing that I was coming like two hundred dollars short every month and just like eating into my savings slowly but surely. Uh, and so then I had to like like stop and be like, okay, I have to find a job that gives me two hundred dollars every month so I can meet so I don't lose all of my finances and like trying to make this work. And then the, the other big lesson for me was um, I, I just, I, for, like, I have such a tight community of artists, a lot of people who are kind of in a similar place as me, uh, trying to figure it out, but also a lot of people that are making it work. So I had uh, some really honest conversations with people, and one of the big things I learned was um, when I'm taking the projects that pay, it has to also pay for the projects that don't get paid. So like, I have like half the time right now I'm doing community projects, which I write grant, grants for, and that can kind of be a full-time job in a lot of ways because I'm constantly communicating around it. I have a lot of people I work with that kind of like reach out after the project is over, uh, showing it in galleries, like no one pays for my time for that. Uh, outreach that I do for myself. So I have to make sure when I'm writing those grants that it accounts for the hours that don't have a dollar sign attached to it. And so that I can also have like maybe 10 hours a week where I go back into my studio and make work that I want to make, not for someone else, but because I know I want to make it. It sounds so easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, we had a talk the other day about the different seasons of your creative life, too, and how sometimes you're able to do it full time, which you've been doing for a little while, <clears throat> excuse me, with, you know, challenging periods and periods where it really feels like it's going to work. And then there's times where you're like, you know what, I could go for a 20 hour a week job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And right um, yeah, like right now. <laughs> and I mean, we heard if anybody was here for Rachel Lindsay's talk, um, which was the first talk of the series, she talked about just that. And and also like kind of the, the way you sort of have to forgive yourself when like you're, you feel like you are and you are certainly perceived as like a full-time artist and suddenly you kind of have to shift. So just being really flexible with yourself. And there's like, for me, it's thinking about what I like to do that is paid and can be paid and then making sure that that, like for instance, I, my community projects are in housing. So there are actually jobs out there where you can organize residents or advocate for affordable housing and it's paid. So, you know, it's just, it's kind of feeling out what works for you and knowing that it's always a balancing act forever. Hell yeah. Um, so you just talked a little bit about this, um, but my next question is who is your squad? So none of us operate what in is, a, what who mean? is your, who, who are your people? Like. Who has enabled you to get where you are today? Who do you talk to on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis? Um, I mean, Abby, you talked about the critique process and how that really like catalyzed your, you did, you mentioned it. it was... I know, but it didn't like help me. Oh, well, I mean, it, it certainly got you asking questions. And I know, Corinne, you have like a group of people that you meet with regularly who are your peers. Um, so can you each talk about sort of like, and it could even just be like, you know, I don't like doing my bookkeeping, so I hire a bookkeeper, and that enables me to like keep going forward. So, who are your people? Should I start? Sure. sure. So I actually I'm really intentional about my group of people. Um, it, it's just like I don't know how I would be doing this today without a pretty extensive peer network. And again, like just to reiterate. It, there's like different tiers of friends. So I have a group of um, art makers who are in a really similar uh, space as I am, kind of like emerging artists. Um, a lot of them are pre-MFA programs. So that's like another big question that I'm not gonna get into, the MFA program. Um, but yeah, for a, a while, um, a group of artists, all female or non-binary artists, and I were meeting every month and um, originally, we we're like, oh, it's going to be a critique group. We're going to do this like skill share. We're going to buy materials together. We had like pretty lofty goals. But 
mostly we just sat and like talked about the process and uh, blew off some steam and talked about our projects and maybe how hard it was or and sometimes people wouldn't even be making art for like months at a time and just like like still being able to show up with other artists and like feel like oh I, I'm part of this I am an artist even if I didn't pick up a paintbrush this week so that I mean that's really important for me and I, I really appreciate that uh, and, and like finding spaces where we could meet for free uh, for a while it was like New City Gallery um, which I know has some structural issues right now uh, and now I'm part of a um, studio group called The Hive on Pine where there's other artists making work and a pretty wide range of work so I'm I identify as a painter but there's definitely people that are doing more craft and trade kind of arts um, as well and illustrators too so it's, it's good to have like a nice mix of artists in that way but I, I also um, identified some mentors pretty early on in like navigating my like art interest. Uh, I kept in touch with my professors from my undergrad and that felt really important. And at first I felt really awkward about it. Like, oh, like you don't want to talk to me now that I'm not like a student, but they did and, you know, and offered like lots of really helpful advice. You know, they would come out and like get a beer with me and you know, I'd be like, oh, I got your beer, thank you. And they're like, ah, we see you're poor. You know, like, <laughs> like they're not like, you don't have to like barter your way into our like presence. Um, and then I also found artists I admire in our own community. Um, and I just like reached out, I was like, hey, like would love to visit your studio. You know, like make it easy for them because Artists are really busy, obviously, because <laughs> we're always working. Um, so make it really easy for them and just like ask questions about their work. You know, like I think that's kind of a whole emerging artists fall into. The, you're so like anxious about how to make it work that you just talk about yourself and it's really important to listen as well. And those artists, you know, helped me uh, write grants. I had um, my first grant I got was from the Vermont, oh, I think the first one I got was from BCA, but when I applied for the Vermont Arts Council Creation Grant, I had an artist read it who I knew had received it before, and she gave me a lot of helpful feedback. Um, so having like a really big range of people, like in terms of people you admire, people who are just starting off, and people who are like in the same boat as you, and making sure that you're meeting with them and, and listening to them. I really enjoyed listening to your response because I feel like that's something that I have definitely fallen short on. Um, as I mentioned, I have, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old at home. I have about 20 hours a week I can work, um, including between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. every night. Um, so... I don't know any other artists, really. It's really sad. Oh, you know us now. Yay! <laughs> well, and you did Jumpstart. That's true, yes. Product-based program. I met program. artists there, and that was actually the first time I'd really gotten to know um, other people in a similar space. And actually, probably the group of people that um, is the most important right now is a very small group of three other working mom, semi-working, -work, like trying to work on creative projects while also raising kids all the same age. Um, and we don't talk so much about our work, more just, um, you know, the solidarity of trying to do it all. Um, but yeah, I, it's something, it's on my list of goals. I, I would love a richer community of artist friends. You should definitely go have one of those for yourself. <laughs> Highly recommend, I can say from the outside. <laughs> um, I guess I just talk about the ideas I have as I go about my life. I don't, I don't know. I don't really have studio visits anymore. I'm not, I did that a lot. And then I think because I maybe I'm scarred from like the experience I had, but I wanted time to not have to talk about it. Um, and then I really was focusing on figuring out a way 
to get jobs that were what I was, you know, using the skills I am good at, which was artsy stuff, I guess. But um, I didn't, that wasn't something I really wanted to talk about because it wasn't my work. It was like applied problem solving type of stuff. Um, but then I meet people through work and like, I have some like new friends that I didn't know before and I didn't know from grad school that I just like met through working like commercial type jobs and we don't always talk about art. We talk about politics <laughs> and stuff, you know, just stuff like, and it sort of weaves in and out, but I think I enjoy not always talking about art. Excellent. Um, Cool. Well, I have a lot more questions that came up for me, but I want to throw it back at everybody else and see if they have questions. Chris, do you have another mic or do you need this one? Okay. Do people have questions? Anybody? Oh, there's one back. Hi. Um, I have a question about taxes. Taxes and, and health insurance. I know that those are basically the the barrier for people who are making a decision to transition between, you know, a, get a day job gig that has benefits included and then one that is, you know, maybe much more self-employed and what that means for really being fully self-supported when there maybe is not the government we would all wish to have in that area. So yes, all the, all the artists, please answer that. Um, so I'm very lucky in that my husband's job pays for his insurance, and then we just pay a ton more on top of that for uh, me and the kids to be insured. Um, as far as taxes, uh, don't do what I do and forget about them um, for the first couple years <laughs> you're an artist. Uh, I was using like TurboTax online or something, and I was putting all my income in, but just like in the wrong spot, and so I basically didn't pay taxes for two years, and then I paid a lot of taxes in year three um, and a lot of fees, so generally, I would say that before you make the leap, and sort of, so as a backstory, I was kind of transitioning out of a day job and into my role as an illustrator, um, uh, you know, kind of like this. <laughs> um, and so when I was just about to make the final leap, I met with, I, I paid for like a one hour with an accountant to sort of figure out how much you have to set aside. But that's a really good question. You definitely, I think it's well worth the money to kind of map out what that would look like before you make a very expensive mistake like I did. But health insurance, man, that just, that sucks. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. It like is an insane amount of money <laughs> that all goes towards that. Sorry. I pay an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and I get the like every extension that you can get and I do my taxes in October. Um, <laughs> but I do them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of ignorant about it. I just, I expense, I make lists of things I spend on making stuff, which is a lot of the things I buy. And the guy that does the taxes knows, like I, pay, I live in work in the same space, so there's some percentage of that that you can write off, which I don't know, but they do, so that's fine. And then, uh, yeah, I'm on New York Medicaid. I'm on Vermont Medicaid. I was on that too. It was, it was it's okay. great. <laughs> it also means I'm still poor, technically. <laughs> but it's great. Uh, also, I mean, first step, as soon as you start making income from your art, open up a separate bank account and have a separate card and have all, of, like... Any, like your tape, your paper. Everything. Everything, <laughs> like, it, like if you have to buy your like special work equipment, obviously, but like if you, there's just so many things, travel, like make sure that's all on that card. It's just gonna make your life so much easier. Um, quarterly taxes, 
if you are your own business, you're supposed to be doing quarterly taxes. It's worth talking to someone that knows taxes, like sit down with them, just hash it out. Um, I still do my taxes at CBOEO. Uh, I've never had an issue with it so far. I will say I definitely am the person that comes in with the most complicated taxes as far as the people that use that service. Uh, but like, I, I guess I don't have a lot more. It's taxes are, te I hate taxes. It's terrible, nobody likes them. Okay. Yes. I just really wanna underscore, ask for help. Like that's like, nobody likes them. Nobody likes taxes. Nobody understands how they work. And so just like get help is really kind of the. Pay for someone as soon as you're able to. Right, I paid a it's premium to have somebody. It's amount of money. Yeah, I paid way too, like way too much and that I sh like technically, like again, once it like my person, it sounds like I'm just a bad business person. I paid I'm a terrible so business person. <laughs> Absolutely terrible business person. Like I, like, you guys of course, do like, all this stuff. I don't do any right. of this stuff. I can't afford to do it. But then as soon as I did it, like it hurt to write the check. But the peace of mind I got and the fact that I knew my taxes would be taken care of and that lessons that I got. And then I also just like squeezed them for every ounce of knowledge I could get. I was like, how does this work? How do I make it better? And they, you know, I was paying them at that point. So they kind of had to tell me. I, I will say if you have a friend who has any kind of small business side business that does their taxes every year, why, like make quarterly dates where you sit down with them and go over taxes together. And that way you can support each other, ask each other questions. Here in Burlington, there's so many people who are self-employed and like know what they're doing. So ask for help. I recently um, made a deal with myself. It's, there's something called, I think it's like something bundling. It's like a behavior mechanism. And so I bundle doing my quarterly taxes with getting a massage. And it's helped a lot. Yeah. It's really made a difference. I recommend it. I think just the rule of thumb that I heard is that as the money starts to come in, you need to set aside 50% of your profits. before And just set it aside. You won't lose it all in taxes, but just set it aside. And then when you figure out your taxes, you can take the rest. But that'll give you a buffer. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, the good news is next week, this is like an advertisement, thank oh, yeah. you. Next week, we have an accountant from Davis and Hodgkins uh, Accounting who's gonna come and talk to you specifically about accounting for artists. That's next Wednesday, 6.30, beer and pizza. And accounting. <laughs> Questions? Um, this one's maybe a little tricky, but how do I get people to care about my artwork? <laughs> <laughs> do you care about your artwork? I care about my artwork. Okay. Why do you feel like they don't care about your artwork? I, I don't necessarily. I just think like um, I need to gain an audience. Or, or like how do I get the people who care about my artwork to grow, I guess. So another way of interpreting this question is how do you grow your brand or your audience if you want to look at it that way? I think uh, just keep doing it and be consistent. Do your own shows. We've had this conversation. But it goes for everyone else in the audience. Uh, like, there's a lot of spaces out there. You have friends that have spaces and white walls and lights. Like, do your own show. Do your own outreach for it. Have all your friends come. Get a b box of wine, cheap box of wine. It's going to be great. And the more you do that, and the more you invite people that you admire to your spaces, they're going to advocate for you. And eventually, it's just going to happen. But when you say, it's going to happen, what do you mean, it? You'll be working all the time, making <laughs> artwork. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, this also kind of came up um, in last, was it last week's talk with the curators? Um, it just like kind of all comes down to relationships, I think. And that's what I heard in a lot of your responses is that like it's just like showing up and doing work and meeting people, even if it's taking down weird stuff at restaurants or day jobs. Or um, I mean, I think about this a lot with Generator too. Like, you know, have a house show or like join a community. And that was something that the curators kept talking about. Yeah, like, like volunteer you get somewhere for something that has nothing to do with art. 
and then just like meet random people. Don't just keep like expecting the same people to buy your art over and over or like don't expect people to buy your art at all. Just try to meet more people, I guess. And glomming onto that, I'm going to refer back to the first uh, uh, Rachel Rachel Lindsay spoke two weeks ago or three weeks ago. She like she has a book. It's out there. Did great. She made all of her cartooning relationships here in Vermont by working at the co-op at the cash register. She literally would like write her handle, like her um, Tumblr or whatever handle, on receipts and like draw comics when she's like not checking people out and that's how she got her name out there so it's just it's it yeah i worked at Pentecost. it was really helpful to meet like everybody in the whole town so. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your favorite creative self-care practices Not having children. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no. My kids are awesome, and I love them, obviously. They're my whole world. But um, they do majorly cut into your creative time. So, um, But I would say, other than that, uh, I like to... Um, so are you asking about like how to take care of yourself when you're not making art, or how to... Oh, you are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad. So I, the, my younger is pretty self-content. She's just a happy one-year-old who will sit there and play with puff balls. Um, but I really, when things are getting a little crazy um, and I am on, the, on duty for parenting, um, I really like to take out a very special box of colored pencils that I hide uh, the rest of the time. And my three-year-old and I will sit there and draw together and they're, they're the professional grade Prisma colors, so she knows that they're not a toy and they are only taken down when it's very serious, like quiet mom and, and daughter drawing time. Um, but I think too, just, you know, if you are a, a parent, um, building, it, as hard as it is to do, and I'm totally guilty of not doing this well, but building time into your life to talk to other adults, um, and uh, you know, turn off your parenting brain because uh, depending on the type of art you do, it can be very hard to be creative and a parent simultaneously. Um, that can be really tricky. So I try and stop parenting at 8 p.m. Sometimes the kids have other ideas, but 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. every night. And I don't do my regular job either. I reserve that time to only do um, the projects that are not bringing in any money. So but it's, I work on picture books at night now, between 8 and 10, every night. <laughs> so I recommend building some firm time in your schedule for that. Um, TD Bank gave me a speaker, cordless speaker, that uh, is shaped like a capsule. And I, I sing into it like a microphone <laughs> because it it, the sound comes out and your voice goes in, and so it feels really good. <laughs> <laughs> Only when my roommate's away. <laughs> so I actually am really like serious about developing self-care practices because I'm like always working like way too much and too many jobs, uh, and I'm not a mom, so like it cannot. Like, I have a lot of compassion for all the mothers out there. My friend just had a baby. It's a really fussy baby. She's having a really hard time. And I've spent some time with her. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, uh, I can't even imagine right now. <laughs> but I will say, like, 
Uh, as soon as you start becoming like working, like self-employed and working for yourself, especially if you're alone in that, it's really important to uh, create like systems in your day to day. For me, my day, like I don't make um, any appointments before 10 a.m. I don't do any meetings before 10 a.m. I designate certain days of the week for meetings if I can. I don't always stick to it. And then I, al I always start the day uh, writing in my journal. That's really important to me. Uh, and then there's certain things that like I really aspire to keep within my life cycle, like yoga and running and walking long distances. Uh, but as soon as things get busy, those are the first things to go, inevitably, every time. So it's kind of like having compassion for yourself, too, when you break your systems that you work really hard to put in place, because it's always going to happen. And then once you get back into them, it just feels so good, like just like recentering. Uh, and I think it's really important to have that because I, I really believe that if you're always in crisis and like responding to whichever fire has happened next, you just can't make deep creative work. Like your brain doesn't have the capacity to process that is important for art making. So like, do it for yourself, but also do it for your art. That was so good. <laughs> yeah, because the I, yeah, my I'm just gonna interject my answer, but it's I think um, stability is self care for me, and I see a lot of people who are creative kind of spinning out all the time, um, and I also practice like my. I, a friend of mine called it zero sum scheduling, where I block out every minute of my day, even if it's like doing nothing it's like on the schedule and that helps and then just like yeah figuring out a good routine um has allowed it. i've i just recently entered like a very creative period and i think it's because i like started really sticking to my my calendar that i've been blocking out and it's been really amazing so sometimes like rigidity lends itself to creativity by the way, as far as the kid things go, uh, be careful about making the art world seem too attractive because 20 years later you might have a child who's a struggling artist also. And that's <laughs> very guilt in incurring. So, uh, so there's been a lot of talk about networking and relationships and that kind of thing, but I'm wondering uh, what else you, and, and you've mentioned applying for grants, but I'm wondering, um, what you do in the way of traditional marketing or kind of strategic efforts to get your name out there and your brand out there outside of just generally building relationships and networking and that kind of thing. I might start. Yeah. Is that okay? Oh. You no, I don't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the art making world in Vermont is really, really small. So if you want to get into galleries, you know what galleries are out there and you know who to do outreach to. Um, I, like for me, like in addition to showing up to, so like Burlington City Arts is a really important contem contemporary art center here in Vermont for obvious reasons. Uh, and so is the universities and the schools because they have lots of professors there that are also art makers and have networks outside of Vermont. Um, so that's like, for me, those are my circles in terms of like face-to-face -face conversations. And then there's Instagram. And that's something I do. Uh, I ha make sure I use good photos. I'm like not great about it. Like there's, Instagram is like this huge hole of like, here's the algorithm and like follow it right. And, but the thing is, if you're an art maker, the, like things like marketing can really get in your way sometimes. It, it just, I don't know particularly what kind of work you're making. Like if you're making lots of products, marketing and having like a color scheme and like continuity is really important. If you're making something like paintings, if you start like adhering to a color scheme, your work is gonna fail like you can't just like make cookies of your paintings like you can't just follow like a recipe so just marketing around things like contemporary art gets a little complicated in that way and I think that 
for me, it's more important to be making the work that makes sense and then to just put it out there like through my social media networks and show up and like talk about it and like try and invite people to come look at it. Uh, and I think it's different if you have a craft that you're doing or like are doing illustrations. I think it's a really different answer. What do you mean? I'm not happy for So, so yeah, not helpful. <laughs> Or maybe, like, you could be a hat maker that has a really similar, you know, like, it's, it's so much of, like, what are your values? Like, who do you need to see that work? Are you making, like, do, do your hats have, like, thematic qualities or, like, things that remain the same? Or are you really interested in breaking, like, your own rules? I just think that for everyone that answer is different. and. A lot of it is just like get it, like feeling a lot of answers and then figuring out what works best for you. But I will. I don't know if I could say any like that. That sounds right to me. <laughs> Thank you. I don't really know how to market myself like as well as I feel like I should. So um, yeah, I, I, there's everybody has an opinion about what you should do and why aren't you doing this and oh that website da 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 da. But like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. Um, I would just say that for me, I, I've actually done almost no marketing <laughs> in the last six years. Um, and so I don't have a lot to speak to that. But I will say that uh, like 95% of the success of my company is based on being in the right market. Um, and so maybe thinking about not how to make your hats stand out in a hat market, but how to make your hand, hats stand out in a different market. Um, because not very many people make hats. I mean, that's awesome. Um, I, I feel like, you know, no specific ideas come to mind because I got four hours of sleep last night. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just sort of thinking about um, what what you could surround your product with. So for instance, a friend of mine was trying to get started in painting and she wasn't getting a lot of traction. She was doing more like home decor type of decorative painting, um, less fine art. Um, but she was having a hard time getting any traction in the painting world because you know, there's a lot of really amazing paintings out there. But then she sort of switched to how she was marketing her paintings by creating like roundups of, um, home decor that had one of her paintings uh, featured, but surrounded it by, it goes with this lamp and this couch, and then it sort of made the painting stand out a lot more than it would have been if she was trying to get it more visibility in the art world. So I don't know, one thing you could think about. Your hats are awesome. I have something to add to that too. Just in that you're making the th all of the hats that you make, like there's got, there's something that remains consistent, you know. Like Abby's like, oh, I don't know how I market myself, but every like lots of people here in Vermont know what Abby's kind of quote brand looks like. Like I know what your work looks like. I I have a what pretty. Would you say it looks I couldn't describe it, but I would know. Like, but I know, like, I know on site, I'm like, that's, that's Abby's work. Even though, like, it's murals and it's, like, sculpture and it's, like, all this kind of thing, like, I recognize your hand in it. And I think that's just true for all artists. So, like, in that you're making your own thing and have your own ideas, there's automatically something, like, unique about it. And then all, the last thing I'll say is like, don't be afraid to reach out to people that are making similar kinds of work or just something that you really like that looks like it's working. Like reach out and ask them like what they think, what they do around marketing or their taxes. You know, like ask questions. You had mentioned earlier um, Etsy and you seem to be you intimated that maybe that's not a good place to be right now. Is that true, or is? You're looking at me. Uh, yeah, when uh, it came up, when you you guys you said something about a uh, marketing 
thing that they asked you to do? At the yeah, I've actually never used Etsy, but my understanding, because I have an online shop and I chose that specifically because Etsy was changing a lot and now it's like there's a lot more pay to play. So like you can put a listing up of a product, but you really do have to, it's sort of like Facebook now, like you have to throw money at it if you want anybody to see anything in your business. And I don't know if you can confirm that, but. Yeah, so I still do about 25% of my sales on Etsy. You definitely, it, it's a nice way to get exposure if you're in a small category like Jewish ceremonial wedding art. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I come right up at the top when you search for that in Etsy. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it is a very bloated marketplace. And if you have limited resources, I would definitely encourage you to focus on your own website and SEO. Um, SEO is a big part of my marketing strategy, and it's easier because it's a small market, but um, Etsy recently increased their fees too. Uh, to Now you lose something like 10% of your revenue to their fees, um, so it's a, it's a lot. Do you wanna cap it off with any, any final thoughts? Um, Sure. I mean, do you have any? Does anybody listen to Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness? No. At the end of every pod, what's that? Sometimes. Oh, so good. Um, at the end of every podcast, he's like, "Okay, it's like this is the yoga class, and like now I like, give you like two minutes, you get to like do whatever position like I didn't tell you to do, and like have your moment." So, is there anything that you want to like, some like downward dog, like asana? You know, what do you what do you want to say? What do you want the people to know? about the DIY approach. I would just like to say that um, I spent all of my 20s trying to shove a very square brain into many round holes. Uh, and like I said, I was fired from two very different jobs and quit many, many others. Um, and it turns out it was because I was supposed to be working for myself. Um, so if you are feeling that pull, it's really hard. It's also incredibly amazing, and I want to support you, so come tell me what I can do to help you. It's, it's worth it. You don't have to say anything, it's fine. I guess I would just say follow your gut. I, I, like, when I first got into doing this kind of work, it felt so out there, you know? It just felt really crazy. It felt not doable, not feasible, and kind of like a made up thing. And then I got a grant and I was like, oh, it's real. And then like several years later, I realized that grants don't make it real. It's just like labor I put into getting money that doesn't necessarily compensate my labor um, fully because it's a lot of work. So, I mean, just like when you have that like gut feeling like, oh, I need to do this thing, like make it happen and ask all the questions you need to ask to get yourself to where you need to go. So. Wait, I have one more thing. <laughs> See, I knew this was gonna happen. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think I think it's just important to really take yourself seriously in what you're doing and not think that other people can do what you do so you undercut it. Like to really like value your work and ask for what you deserve. Like don't think, oh no, they're gonna think I'm like, think I'm so great because I want this much money for this. But like, you know when you have to, someone asks you like what you want for it, you can kind of identify that sweet spot of like, how much you've, I mean, you would feel great if you got like this much, but you'd feel pretty good if you got this much. You'd do it for this much and feel okay, but you like would feel so bad about yourself if you did it or for this, or like sold it for that much, you know? And I think each, each time, at least in my experience, you kind of have to refactor it. It's never the same exact like way of figuring it out, but you can figure it out. Like, how much do you want to make per, I don't know, like you guys seem a lot more organized, like in terms of like setting schedules and stuff. And honestly, I have no schedule. I have no Google whatever. I have like, I write it on my hand. Like I'm like a mess. Like I have, and 
I'd like to be more like that, but I've never been like that. So I'm just not. And like, sometimes I don't write anything down. You know, like, it's not, I'm not saying it's like the way everyone should do it, but I don't know. I just think like, you, like you said, like you just kind of know, like, and then sometimes you get a little brave and you're like, I'm gonna ask for a little more this time. And then like, they're like, oh yeah, sure. And you're like, what? Okay. <laughs> and then your friend's like, oh my God, like it's like, ask for way more. Like, but you're like, it's, if it doesn't feel, even if your friends are like, you should ask for this, you should ask for this. But like, if it doesn't feel like, it doesn't just like, you can just say it and roll off the tongue and own it. Like, this is what it costs to do this. You gotta find that spot where you can own it and then like go from there. I don't know. The the one thing, the last, last thing I'll say, and I just remembered this. Um, for me, when I talked to other artists about like projects, it was so helpful when they were clear about how much they were being paid for things. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important for Yeah, always equity. talk about it up front. Yeah. Never be just like, oh, I bet they'll pay me. But like, also like, like be honest with each other about how much you get paid for things because what ends up happening is that women don't get paid as much as men if like- But I think women honest. don't ask for as much money as men. I, well, and that's why it's so important to have like real like honest conversations about money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Here, I'm gonna get this back again. And I think, and I'd say one more thing. And I- <laughs> <laughs> My biggest thing about like, cause I don't live here anymore. I live in New York, I love it here, but it's a really hard place to live and work, like make your money as an artist all the time, you know? But I just think maybe Generator can do it, but there's gotta be some like big, huge conference on pricing your work. Don't price your work at $20. I don't care what it is. Like that's, that's undercutting everyone, you know? Cause mm -hmm. no artist should get $20, did it take you less than an hour? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, if you want, do you want to like minimum, like don't take less than minimum wage for like your artwork. It's just like, no. And like, don't hire elementary school kids to have contests to design things that you could hire artists to pay them for. I mean, like, it is like the biggest peeve. Like I could go on and on and on about this, but. Actually go on, go on. we want to okay. hear more about okay. that. Also. <laughs> <laughs> I love all of the like benefit auctions for things, right? Because we all want to help out the homeless or everything. But like, don't ask the artist to do artwork on weird shaped things. I'm not gonna tell, I'm not gonna <laughs> hands or whatever, but like, and then have a silent auction where there's no minimum. People come in, they want to buy a piece of yours because they like you as an artist. They're like, I can get a great sweet deal on this. And they buy the piece of your work for $15 and then they don't buy the art at your, at your show because they have a piece of yours that they bought at like a silent auction that wasn't really your work, but th somebody really wanted you to do it and you, you did it because you just want to make them, you know, you want to please somebody sometimes. But <laughs> like, I just think like all of these things because then they're all meant for a good purpose, it's hard to critique them and I try to just, I just grumble about it to like individual people. <laughs> Here I am like saying it to the camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just think like people spend money on sports or whatever you spend your money on, but like when it comes to paying money for artwork, people are like, oh God, like, bleh, and they won't. And they think it should be cheap and they think it should be free or whatever. and it undercuts when everybody lowers their prices and people ask for donations from artists for artwork. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to say no. <laughs> no more of that. Like, everyone should, there should be like a standard pricing on, I don't know, it could be like, I wish that would happen. Yeah. yeah. Have your dentist have a show in their office, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, That's bartering. Okay. And they always hit the artist up, but they never go to like, hey, what are Right, oh, would every dentist, donate yeah, donate. Free tire rotation. <laughs> right, why or get they, a sponsor for think, your event and then use that sponsorship the money to, to pay artists. Or like, it's my private school is having an auction, so we want you to give <laughs> Like my cousin who doesn't even like ever talk to me asked me that. But anyway. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Oh my God, I hope they never see that. <laughs> but, there, but don't stop, because there is this thing about being in Vermont, which yeah. is that we have totally screwed ourselves, that we are a 19th century agrarian theme park where people don't want to spend real money on art. They think it's but all... But they'll spend it at Frog Hollow. They'll spend it on crafts. Uh, but, but yeah, they but they spend actually it on won't spend very much. You know, they're like, $295 is the maximum amount they'll spend for well, anything. Well, that would be like, if that was... A like median amount that people paid for artwork, that would be a start. Yeah, but if you take two weeks to make a painting, you know, that's not going to do it. I know. Yeah, it's Vermont. Vermont's really weird. You go, to, but you go anywhere else, you know, and you know, and other places, you know, uh, go to Provincetown and they pay real money for art, but up here they don't. I know. Sorry, didn't mean don't to be end sorry. this on a bummer. I'm sorry. Breaking hearts. <laughs> 